Hi, in this lesson, we're going to go over the second part of the cardiovascular system. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about the cardiac muscle tissue. I'm going to talk about the cardiac muscle cycle and the cardiac conduction system. Okay, first, let's go ahead and look at the heart muscle. The heart muscle is going to be, the cardiac muscle is going to be striated. It's going to be short, it's going to be, have branchings, and it's going to be interconnected. Um, the endomesium acts as both an origin and insertion. And one of the unique things about the cardiac muscle is that it has intercalated discs. None of the other muscles in your body are going to have these intercalated discs here. And also the heart functions as a syncytium. What does that mean? It means that this, all the cells in the heart basically function as one unit together. Okay, let's go ahead and look at this picture over here. You could see right here, this is the cardiac muscle. And here's one of the unique things about it is the intercalated discs are gonna be right here. Here are the intercalated discs over here. Um, the intercalated, intercalated discs have something called gap junctions, if you guys remember this from AMP1, and desmosomes. So gap junctions are these junctions over here. They keep the cells connected to each other, adjacent cells connected to each other, but they also provide this pathway for ions to travel from one cell to another or from, for small molecules to travel from one cell to another. This is important in the cardiac muscle because we want action potentials to rapidly travel from one cell to the adjacent cells. There's also something called desmosomes, another type of junction. I always say that desmosomes kind of look like Velcro or maybe paper clips. Their function is to hold adjacent cell membranes together. So you're going to find both desmosomes and gap junctions here in the intercalated discs. So the intercalated discs are holding the muscles, um, the muscle cells very tightly together so that they don't tear apart, but they also provide channels where one cell can quickly communicate with another cell. Okay. Um, some of the properties of muscles, all muscles we know they're excitable, meaning that they have the ability to generate action potentials. Um, they can contract, meaning they can become shorter, short would not really be the proper term, but for the sake of learning, that's the term we're going to use. Um, they can extend and become longer, so they become short and long, and also they're elastic. So this is the properties of all muscles pretty much. However, the cardiac muscle has two more properties that are unique just to the cardiac muscle. They have automaticity. What does that mean? It means that it can contract by itself. The heart has the ability to contract by itself without any help from the nervous system. Um, if you have seen videos of heart transplants, whenever they take a heart out and they have to give it to a donor, the heart is still contracting by itself. So when they take it out of the, the patient's body, it's still contracting without receiving any stimulation from the nervous system. So it automatically can contract by itself. And it also has autorhythmicity. That means that not only does it contract by itself, it also contracts in a rhythm. Your heartbeats happen in a particular rhythm. Okay, there are three circulations to keep in mind from the heart. The pulmonary circulation, this is the part of the heart that's going to receive 
deoxygenated blood from different parts of the body and send it to the lungs to become oxygenated. So this is actually the, what the right side of the heart is going to be responsible for. So this is right side. Okay, the systemic circulation receives this oxygenated blood from the lungs and sends it to the organs. So all of the organs and tissues in your body need oxygen. So therefore, blood has to become oxygenated and then the heart can send it to different parts of the body to nourish the tissues. So this is what the left side of the heart is responsible for. And then we have something called coronary circulation. Um, this is the part of the circulation. It's technically part of the systemic circulation, but coronary circulation is when the heart provides blood to its own tissues. So the heart is this muscular organ and muscles cannot function without any oxygen, without any nourishment. So one of the first things that the heart is gonna do is going to, once it receives that oxygenated blood, it's gonna push it into the aorta. And one of the first things that's branching off of the aorta is the coronary arteries. And the coronary arteries are going to supply blood to the myocardium, the muscles of the heart. If you look at the heart, it has these veins and arteries on it. Those are called the coronary arteries and veins. Those arteries are responsible for nourishing the tissue of the heart itself. Something to keep in mind about the pulmonary circulation. If we look at the left side of the lungs, well, excuse me, left side of the heart, we see that it is thicker, has a thicker muscle than the right side. And that is because the right side is responsible for pulmonary circulation. And pulmonary circulation is a short distance. So the muscles in the right side of the heart don't need to be that thick because they're not pumping it a long distance away. They also are low resistance and low pressure. This is so the right side of the heart is a low pressure pump. Um, keep in mind that even though the right side has a thinner wall, it has lower pressure, it still pumps the same volume of blood. So the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart pump the same volume. It's just that the pressure in the right side and the left side are going to be different. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the circulation here. Okay, so here is the right atrium right here. It's gonna receive the oxygenated blood. It's gonna pour down into the ventricles. And we're gonna talk about all of this more specifically in just a second. And then the ventricles are gonna pump it into the pulmonary trunk right here. So it's going to travel through the pulmonary trunk. It's going to branch and become the pulmonary arteries. Yes, arteries because they're taking blood away even though it's deoxygenated. So here the colors are going to be switched. It's not red, it's blue. So one goes to the left lung and the other one goes to the right lung. So what's going to happen here is gas exchange at the lungs. And then here also you get gas exchange. So once these red blood cells become oxygenated, this is where the color change happens. They appear red and then they're gonna return 
to the heart again. But this time, they're going to pour into the left atrium. They pour into the left atrium and then the left ventricle. The left ventricle is going to push this blood, just pump this blood into the aorta. So this is the aorta here. Aorta is the, the main artery in your body. And from the aorta, this oxygenated blood is going to spread out to all other organs and tissues in your body. And then the cycle continues. Okay, as we could see here, left ventricle much thicker than the right ventricle because the left ventricle has to pump blood all throughout your body. It, it has higher pressure and it has to travel a longer distance. The, the right ventricle here is thin walled. As you can see, it has lower pressure and it needs to pump blood to a shorter distance. It just needs to pump it to the lungs. So functionally and to some extent structurally, the two sides of the heart are, have differences. Okay, two important terms to keep in mind, systole and diastole. Systole is when the heart contracts. Diastole is when the heart relaxes. We could use this for both the atria and the ventricles. So atrial systole is when the atria, the two top chambers, are going to contract. Ventricular systole is the, when the ventricles, the two bottom chambers, are going to contract. Diastole is going to be the relaxation. So atrial diastole is when the atria is going to relax. And ventricular diastole is when the ventricles are going to relax. So both the atrias contract and the ventricles contract, and the atria relaxes and the, ve the ventricles relax. Diastole and systole, it's important to learn these definitions. Okay, I'm gonna go over um, the circulation. I'm gonna simplify it as much as possible, and this is gonna be more specific than it was in my previous video. Okay, Okay. here, here's the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. This is the opening of the superior vena cava, and this is the opening of the inferior vena cava. Right here, you would have the opening of the coronary sinus. This is the right atrium. So first, let's start here. You're going to have deoxygenated blood pouring in from all three vessels into the right atrium. And it's going to pour down. If both chambers are relaxed, it's going to pour down passively first into the ventricles. And then it's going to, this atrium here is going to contract. When it contracts, this is called atrial systole. When it contracts, it's basically pumping blood or pushing blood, all of its blood, down into the ventricles. What's going to happen next is that this ventricle here, the right ventricle, is going to fill with blood. Once it is filled with blood, remember this tricuspid valve here responds to pressure changes. It's, it's going to fill with blood and it's going to begin to contract. Okay. 
this pressure change in the ventricle, in the right ventricle, it's going to cause this valve right here to close. Because remember, these valves respond to pressure changes. And there's going to be a period where this right ventricle here is going to contract. This AV valve here is going to be closed. But also, this one over here, this pulmonary semilunar valve is also going to be closed. So um, there's this period where the ventricle is going to contract and the, the pressure inside of it is going to increase dramatically. So this increase in pressure that's going to build up in this ventricle when the two valves are closed and the, the ventricle is filled is going to open this valve up. So this is contracting, it's going to open the pulmonary semilunar valve and push blood into the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary trunk and then pulmonary arteries, which are going to take the oxygenated blood to the lungs. Same thing here, one goes to the left, the other one goes to the right lung. And what's going to happen is that it's going to become oxygenated. oxygenated blood appears red, it's going to come back through the pulmonary veins. These are the pulmonary veins. And you can't see it, but all four of these pulmonary veins are going to pour into the left atrium. I may have accidentally put right ventricle here. It's supposed to be right atrium. Um, so once oxygenated blood pours into the left atrium, it's going to pour down, some of it is going to pour down into the left ventricle passively, and then it's going to contract. So the left atrium is going to contract. pumping or pushing all of its blood down into the ventricles. Next, the ventricle is going to fill with blood and it's going to begin to contract. That contraction and that pressure change is going to cause this bicuspid valve or this left AV valve to close. And when it's closed, there's going to be a period where both of these, the left AV valve and the aortic semilunar valve, are both going to be closed. And blood is going to be, the ventricle is going to be filled with blood and it's going to contract. So there's going to be a lot of pressure building up here in the left ventricle. That pressure change causes the aortic semilunar valve to open and blood is basically going to shoot up into the aorta like this. The reason why that pressure needs to build up is that pressure here in the left ventricle has to become greater than pressure in the aorta. And from the aorta, blood is going to travel, oxygenated blood is going to travel all throughout the body and provide oxygenated blood to different tissues of the body. By the way, this is the bottom portion of the aorta right here. The aorta continues into your abdominal pelvic area and the name of it is going to change. So this would be like ascending aortic arc. Behind the, the uh, heart, it will become the thoracic abdominal aorta. It, it's going to be in your abdominal pelvic cavity. So you may have to go over this a few times before you could really understand it, but it is very mechanical. Um, if you pay attention to the way that the heart looks, look at the, which side is thicker, which side is thinner, what does it connect to, it will all begin to make sense. So I talked about each chamber individually. I talked about the, each atria individually, each ventricle by itself, because I want you to understand what's going on at each chamber at a time. However, that's not how the heart works. The heart actually works more like this. The two atriums contract together, and then the two ventricles are going to contract together. 
So 2H, so what's happening in the left side? The left side and the right side of the heart are working together, not separately. So why is that? Why is it that the two atriums contract together and the two ventricles also contract together? Well, because when one cell, the way things work in the heart is that when one cell undergoes action potentials, it spreads to all of its adjacent cells. Remember, we had those gap junc junctions and in the intercalated disc, and their function is to spread action potentials. So there's no synapsing going on in the cardiac muscle. In the heart, action potentials are all or nothing. When it starts, it's going to spread through, through the whole heart. So again, this is important because we want the heartbeat to spread to the whole heart. So muscular contraction, like the atrial contraction that we talked about, ventricular contraction that we talked about, how do they happen? They happen with action potentials. So if you guys remember from AMP1, the term depolarization, when there is this reverse in membrane potential, that's called depolarization. So muscular contraction is followed right after depolarization of the membrane. Um, and also, the heart is a syncytium. means that all of its cells function together as one unit. And we could actually divide the heart into two syncytiums. There's the atrial syncytium, so they form one group together. And then there's the ventricular syncytium and another group. So the muscles of the atria together form one group and the muscles of the ventricle together form one group. And that's why when an action potential happens anywhere in the atria, it's going to spread through the whole atria to both atrias at the same time and both of them are going to contract together. And the same thing with the ventricles. You don't have one ventricle contracting and then another when action potential begins to spread through the ventricle, it's going to happen to both of them at the same time, and they're going to contract together. So what causes action potentials in the heart? It is something called the cardiac conduction system. So throughout the heart, there's going to be clumps and strands of specialized cardiac tissue that initiate and distribute impulses throughout the myocardium. They're right here in blue. We should remember the names of these, um, understand how they function. These are the structures in the heart. They're specialized cardiac tissues that generate and spread action potentials. That's their function. And remember, this is important because heartbeats cannot happen without action potentials. That contraction of the heart cannot happen unless there's action potentials there. Okay, let's go ahead and look at the first part. We have the sinoatrial node, the SA node. This is going to be the pacemaker of the heart. Let's take a look at it right here. So right here, the structure here, this is going to be the SA node. This is what generates the primary thing that generates action potentials and generates your heartbeats. Okay, it is located in the right atrium near the superior vena cava. And it doesn't need any type of stimulation for action potentials. It just generates action potentials spontaneously. This is what generates the heart's ryth rhythmic contractions. So the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. You probably have heard of someone who has had pacemakers in their heart. When they talk about that, they're talking about someone who has an artificial pacemaker in their heart because something is um, not quite functional about the SA node or the pacemakers that they have in their own heart. So they need assistance in rhythmic contractions of their heart. The SA node can generate 70 to 80 action potentials per beat at rest. So again, here is the SA node. Really important to know the functions and also to be able to identify them on a picture like this.
Okay, now let's look at the next part of the conduction system. You have the atrioventricular or the AV node. Let's look at that one. Here is the AV node right here. So SA node, and now here we have the AV node. The AV node is located on the inferior portion of the interatrial septa. So it is located also on the right um, atrium. This is going to be slower than the SA node, but it is the second, excuse me, there's a typo here, the second fastest part of the conduction system. So SA node would be the fastest, and AV node is the second fastest. The impulses are delayed as they move through the AV node, allowing time for the atria to contract. This is important. It's important that there is a delay for the action potential to move through the AV node because you want the atria to contract first and push all the blood into the ventricles before the ventricles begin to contract. If the SA node is damaged, the AV node will become the pacemaker of the heart. So it is not the pacemaker if you have a healthy functioning SA node. It can generate 40 to 60 action potentials per beat, so it can be life-sustaining. It's not as efficient as the SA node. And the AV node delay is about 100 milliseconds. Okay, if we look at it right here, when the SA node generates action potentials, when the SA node generates action potentials, it's going to spread all throughout the atria. So it's going to spread to this atria right here, but it's also going to spread to the left atria. Because remember, the atrias are a sentient. They, they function together. So both atria is going to, both atriums are going to repolarize or depolarize together at the same time. The atrioventricular or AV bundle, also called bundle of His, this is going to be the only electrical connection between the atria and the ventricles. This is the slowest part of the conduction system, so by itself, without the SA or the AV node, it would not be life-sustaining and it generates 20 to 40 action potentials per minute. So by itself, if it only could generate 20 to 40 action potentials or beats it per minute, so it's not life-sustaining by itself. But the function of it is to spread activity to the ventricles. After action potentials have been spread to the atria, we want to spread them also to the ventricles. Okay, let's look at it right here. Here is the atrioventricular bundle, right here, or bundle of His. So SA node, the pacemaker of the heart, the most efficient one. AV node, AV node is going to serve as a doorway. So the action potential is going to jump here from the SA node. It's going to go to the atriums, but it's also going to jump to the AV node. It's going to be delayed for a little bit. And then it's going to move down here to the AV bundle or bundle of His. And bundle of His is going to start moving the action potential down towards the ventricles. There's also, so the bundle of His is going to branch and form two pathways in the interventricular septa. And one is going to move towards the left, one bundle is going to move towards the left, and the other bundle is going to move towards the right. So here are the bundle branches over here. This is the left bundle branch, this is the right bu bundle branch. So these two are going to carry action potentials down to the apex of the heart, this pointed region of the heart. The Purkinje fibers are, are going to complete the pathway into the apex and the ventricular walls. 
Purkinje fibers are basically these little branchings right here. These are called the Purkinje fibers. So they're going to carry this action potential into the walls of the ventricles. So this is how action potentials or um, depolarization happens. It starts at the SA node. It's going to spread through the atrium. It's going to jump to the AV node. There's going to be a little delay here because we want to wait for the atriums to contract first. And then it's going to move down. This is the doorway into the ventricles. It's going to move down into the atrioventricular bundle, AV bundle. And then from the AV bundle, it's going to spread through the bundle branches, move down the septum to the apex, and then move up to the wall areas of the ventricles. And then once this um, depolarization happens in the ventricles, the ventricles are going to contract. So atria contracts first, a little delay, and then the ventricles contract next. This is the EKG or ECG electrocardiogram you should be able to understand what is going on here at each wave. So let's look at that. This is the P wave right here. The P wave is going to represent atrial depolarization. And remember that contraction of the muscle happens right after depolarization. So here the atria, the atriums are going to contract and then, excuse me, the atriums are going to depolarize and then contraction would happen somewhere around here. Next you have the QRS complex. This is going to be depolarization of the ventricles. So depolarization of atria, you have the atrial contraction shortly afterwards depolarization of the ventricles. Um, the graph is much bigger. This, this is going to shoot up much higher because the ventricles are bigger, they're stronger, they have higher pressure. This is where the ventricles are depolarizing. And the T wave right here this represents ventricular repolarization. So you might ask, where is the atrial repolarization where it starts to relax? It's hidden by the QRS complex. It's in here, but we can't see it because ventricular depolarization is happening and it's a much bigger graph, so it's hiding it. So when we look at action potentials, we could see that the atria are going to contract from top down and the ventricles contract from bottom up. Okay, let's put those things together with the QRS, the whole EKG or uh, ECG graph. So here, the SA node, this is the pacemaker of the heart, it's going to initiate an action potential and it's going to begin to depolarize the atrium. So that depolarization of the atrium creates this P wave right here. Okay, okay next, 
And you can see that right here, the atrial depolarization is going to be complete. And the impulse right here, it's going to jump from the SA node to the AV node. The action potential is going to move to the AV node. The AV node is the doorway to the ventricles. However, there's going to be a small delay at this point. We're going to wait for the atrium to be able to fully contract and push all of its blood into the ventricles before spreading the action potential to the ventricles. Okay, here is the QRS complex. The action potential has a move down the AV node and move down the bundle branches here. It's going to spread, it's going to move down the septum and it's going to move up into the ventricular walls. So the QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization. At this point, you can see that the atrium is repolarizing, so it's beginning to relax, but we can't see it in the graph because it's hidden by the QRS complex. At this point, towards the end of the QRS complex, the ventricular depolarization is going to be complete and the ventricle is going to be contracting. The ventricles are going to contract. And then T wave here represents ventricular repolarization. You can see here that it's starting to repolarize. So T wave represents ventricular repolarization. And then when at the very end of the T wave is when the ventricular repolarization is complete. So here, the ventricles are going to be relaxed. Okay, this is the Wiggers diagram. It looks pretty complicated, but it sums up all of the cardiac cycle. It puts all of the cardiac cycle together in one graph. So we're going to break it down and go over each line here one at a time. Okay, from the bottom, this is the phonocardiogram right here. The phonocardiogram shows the sounds created by the heart. Here is the electrocardiogram. We went over that already. The electrocardiogram shows us how the action potentials are spread throughout the heart. So this is the pattern of the spread of action potentials in the heart. This is the ventricular volume right here, and it is important to keep in mind that this graph here is only talking about, it's only in reference to the left side of the heart. Remember that pressure in the left side of the heart and the right side of the heart are not the same in the two ventricles so it wouldn't be appropriate to use one graph for both sides okay so the here the red line represents the volume of blood that is in the left ventricle This blue line here, this lighter blue line, this represents ventricular pressure because the pressure of the ventricle is going to change as it contracts and it relaxes. This is the atrial pressure right here. Here's the pressure in the atrium. And this is the aortic pressure, pressure in the aorta, again, we're just here talking about the left side of the heart and the left side connects to aorta so that's what we're going to be concerned with we're not going to be worried about the pulmonary trunk in this graph because that's the right side of the heart okay <clears throat> this is one cardiac cycle right here this is another cardiac cycle right here Okay, let's go ahead and interpret this graph. 
So we already know what the P wave is. Went over it earlier. This represents vent excuse me, atrial depolarization right here. Right here, you could see the atria right here. Look at the pressure in here. The pressure is going to go up just a little bit right after the atrial depolarization. So I'm going to write it down right here. Atrial depolarization. I do have a nice handwriting. It's just the tablet that I'm using. Um, here's the atrial depolarization. And right after atrial depolarization, if you guys remember, you're going to have atrial contraction. So if we look at the pressure in the atria, we could see that it's going to go up right after the P wave because it's contracting. Those chambers are going to contract, so the pressure in it is going to rise. Okay, next we're going to get into the QRS complex right here. This is the ventricular depolarization. What happens when the ventricles depolarize, you, right afterwards you get a contraction. So let's follow it up over here. Look at this right here. So when the ventricles depolarize and begin to contract, the AV valves, the left AV valve, the mitral valve, is going to close because this is the valve that responds to changes in pressure, the AV valve. So it's going to close. And right here, we could see that the pressure, when it closes, the pressure in the ventricle is going to begin to rise. Um, and up here, this is where the aortic valve opens. So there's this phase, this is called the isovolumetric contraction right here. This is a phase where blood has filled in the ventricles. It's contracting. However, both of its valves are also closed. So there is going to be an increase in pressure over here. There's a rise in pressure in the ventricle. This is important to get the aortic semilunar valve to open. You can see that the aortic semilunar valve, these two things are identical here, the aortic semilunar valve here opens when the pressure in the ventricle goes above the pressure in the aorta. So in order to open the aortic semilunar valves, the left ventricle has to increase its pressure above the aortic pressure to open up that aortic semilunar valve. Once it opens it, blood is basically, basically going to shoot into the aorta right here. So right here, you could see that the pressure is beginning to drop because blood is going to pour into the aorta and the pressure in the ventricle is going to go down. However, if you look at the volume, the ventricular volume right here, you can see that because the blood is going to be ejected into the aorta, the volume of the blood is going to decrease in the ventricle. Okay, at this point, we basically pushed all the blood up into the aorta, and then the aortic valves are going to close to prevent that black backflow of blood into the ventricles. And here's what's going to happen here. At this point, the ventricles are going to relax. They're going to uh, repolarize and begin to relax right here. And um, blood is going to pour in passively into the ventricles. So right here, you could also see the T wave. T wave was supposed to represent ventricular repolarization. It's empty. It just pumped all of its blood into the atria, excuse me, into the aorta. So now it's 
the volume has decreased and the pressure is going to go down and the aorta is going to the aortic semilunar valve is going to close to prevent backflow of blood so this is basically the same thing right here as this one over here the phonocardiogram over here this is the lup sound with the av valves closing remember av valves close they create that first heart sound lup and then when the semilunar valves close they create the second heart sound dup and by the way, there are little sounds afterwards, but they're not uh, loud enough for us to hear at all. Here are some definitions to remember. Cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by each ventricle in one minute. Cardiac output equals the heart rate times the stroke volume. So amount of blood pumped in one minute by the ventricles, heart rate times stroke volume. So how do you increase your cardiac output? Well, you can't increase your heart rate if you exercise, your cardiac output is gonna increase. But you could also increase your stroke volume. So, how do you increase your stroke volume is mainly by exercise. By the parasympathetic cardio inhibitory center of the medulla. Remember the vagus nerve from AMP1? This is the nerve that's going to leave the cranial area and innervate most of your visceral organs. The parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for the rest and digest part of your nervous system. So this is the part of your nervous system that basically calms you down. So this, the parasympathetic nervous system, slows heart rate down. When you're relaxed, your heart rate tends to be slower. The heart is also stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system, by the cardioaccelatory center of the medulla. The sympathetic nervous system is that part of your body that is involved with fight or flight. So this is when you get nervous or when you feel um, anxious or um, any kind of threat, your heart starts to race faster and faster. That is your sympathetic nervous system. And that is caused by epinephrine, the hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine that are secreted by the adrenal medulla. So stress, anxiety, exercise, all of those things are going to increase your heart rate. Okay.